submit oneself to this spiritual teacher. So that is not a very easy thing for most of us to do. Because in material life, we are conditioned and we're attached and proud of our identity and our position in this world. And it makes it difficult for us to have to submit ourselves to someone else. But this is the process by which we acquire transcendental knowledge. So the first thing is to uh, offer obeisances. Uh, and then the next thing is to put questions to inquire before the spiritual teacher. We want to understand the Absolute Truth. So, part of the duty of the, the, the aspiring candidate, the disciple, one who wants to develop transcendental knowledge, is to inquire about it, so that the spiritual teacher will be willing to reveal the truth to us because a spiritual teacher may think, well, they're not very interested. Why should I waste my time? Why should I bother to tell them anything? They don't ask anything. So just keep quiet. We see, for example, in Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, Maharaj Rahugan, and recruited people to carry his palanquin. And one of the persons who were recruited to carry his palanquin was Jad Bharat. And Jad Bharat was carrying the palanquin, but at the same time, he was very careful when he walked, he wouldn't step on insects which were coming across his path. And this caused some disturbance for Maharaj Rahugan. He was in the palanquin and he was being shaken about. And he got abusive. He began to speak harsh words to Jambara. He did not understand the position of Jambara. He didn't know that Jambara was a self-realized person. So he was for Maharaj Rahugan became fortunate because Jan Bharat went on to explain the absolute truth to Maharaj Rahugan. <coughs> so inquiry is a, an important part of the process of understanding spiritual knowledge. We of course can read books, we can read on our own, but that may not be enough because we have to confirm our understanding of what we read. We may read the books and at the same time we may be, may be keeping many conceptions in our mind of the nature of devotional service, and of the position of Krishna, and we may have a lot of misunderstandings. Although we're reading the books, there may still be many misunderstandings in the nature of the truth. So it's important that we also inquire. And then, service. We, are, we describe bhakti yoga as devotional service. There should be service rendered. We have to learn how to give service to Lord Krishna and to the Vaishnavas. That is part of our duty as devotees. So giving service is not just giving some monetary contribution. Giving service means actually taking up the work are assisting the spiritual teacher in his mission of distributing Krishna consciousness to others. 
we have many activities which involve, uh, you know, you could call them propaganda. We are always thinking how to make some propaganda for the Krishna consciousness movement. We like that people should know, they should hear about Krishna. And to do that, we have different activities, like tomorrow we have the festival for Lord Chaitanya's appearance day, and a big program is planned. So that's, you know, that's propaganda. We're inviting people to come and hear, hear about Lord Chaitanya, and take part in the activities like chanting the holy name and taking prasadam in the association of devotees. These are important activities. Devotee is expected to celebrate the major festivals of Lord Krishna. We have also every year you have Rathiatra. This is another of our propaganda activities. You see, we, we want people to know about Rathiatra and how we are trying to give pleasure to the Supreme Lord we, by putting Lord Jagannath and his brother and sister on a chariot and pulling them round the field. It's very pleasing to Lord Jagannath. And when Lord Jagannath is pleased, then devotees also become pleased. We all become happy by these activities. And we hope that other people will also, new people will also become inspired and take up the process of devotional service. There are many activities to be performed in devotional service. Of course, in our uh, hall in the in the Cuff Road, where we have where you have your programs, you have Jagannath. Jagannath deity is there, and worship is offered there. So, devotees are expected to take part in the activities which go on there. Taking initiation is, becomes a commitment to give more service for Krishna. And service to Krishna is performed through the Krishna Consciousness Movement. We have our association for serving Krishna. So there are some standards by which we engage people in devotional service. Some activities require a more qualified person, a more qualified devotee. For example, worshipping the deity is gener generally done by twice-initiated devotees. At least they should be first-initiated, and preferably they should be twice-initiated. We do have two initiations within Krishna Consciousness. The first initiation is giving the initiation, uh, we, uh, we're giving the beads and giving a name. The second initiation is giving the Gayatri Mantra and engaging in the worship of the deities. The qualification for the first initiation is that one has faithfully practiced the regulative principles. We have four regulative principles. This is taken from the Srimad Bhagavatam. In the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, we read, we read there, Maharaj Parikshit, while touring the earth, he came across a person who was beating a cow on a bull. So in that section of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes that the bull is the personification 
of religious principles. And the bow stands on four legs. So the pillars of religion are four. Satyam, Dayam, Tapa, Socham. Satyam meaning truthfulness. A devotee, all religious people should accept the principle of truthfulness. We should be truthful in our deeds, in our actions. It's a very important principle. But in the Kali Yuga, we do not find a lot of truth. People tend, uh, they, they, they're very much inclined to be dishonest, to be untruthful, to lie about things. So truthfulness is very important. It is said that Mother Earth can carry any number of burdens on her planet. But one thing which she cannot tolerate is that of a person who is untruthful. So satyam, socham, cleanliness. We know how it's very important to be clean, to keep things clean and to be clean ourselves. Cleanliness is not only external but also internal. We have to clean our heart by chanting the holy name of Krishna. Externally, of course, that's with bathing, changing clothes regularly. But internal cleanliness is more important. Cleansing the mind by remembrance of Krishna. And the best way to remember Krishna is by chanting his holy name. Then, daya meaning mercy. Srila Prabhupada describes that mercy is destroyed by eating of animal food. So a devotee is a strict vegetarian. We don't eat meat or fish or eggs. We don't even want to take food which are mixed with onions and garlic. We know here in Singapore there are many restaurants which have vegetarian. You know they're advertising vegetarian. But generally nearly all of them are with onions and garlic. And these foods are not pure foods. These foods are very rajasic and they stimulate the passion and the ignorance in our bodies and in our minds. So devotees, very careful what kind of food we put into our mouth. Because when we put impure foods, then it affects our mind, it affects our consciousness. So, devotee likes to take Krishna prasadam. Now, that's not always possible. Some, many, of course, working people you go out to job every day. You're not always able to cook for yourself. So, sometimes you may have to eat outside. But as much as possible, we want to take Krishna prasadam. If you do have to eat outside, then it should be pure vegetarian, without onions and garlic, and at least within our mind, we should offer it to Lord Krishna. This is how a devotee will act. And then tapa, tapa, austerity. Austerity is destroyed by pride. In the Kali Yuga, again, pride is a very big thing. The Prabhupada has a, a, he quotes a saying here, which we have in the English language, even the pauper is proud of their penny. You know, even we don't have very much, but we're proud of it. Pride, this is what we would call a hunkar or a false ego. And this is a type of intoxication. Intoxication is what 
generally, we generally think of intoxication as destroying our austerity. And we think, oh, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't take any kinds of intoxicants. But we have to also give up pride. And that is a difficult thing to give up. Pride. How can we give up pride? Well, by chanting the holy name of Krishna faithfully, it certainly helps a great deal to overcome pride regularly, faithfully chanting at least 16 rounds of the Holy Name every day helps us to give up this, this pride, this uh, attachment to this material body, to our identity. So these are the four pillars of religion. And at the time of the initiation, all of the candidates, they make a vow to follow these four principles. No meat, no fish, no eggs, no intoxication, no gambling, and no illicit sex. So we want to, we have to be very strong in order to fulfill these vows. And we get this strength by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, by chanting the holy name. What is very difficult becomes very easy when we take help from Krishna, when we take the shelter of Lord Krishna, then it becomes very easy for us to do this, to follow these four principles. So, at the time of initiation, the candidates not only vow to follow the four principles, but they also vow to chant a minimum Sixteen rounds every day. Now to chant at least sixteen rounds every day, it's going to take about at least two hours a day. At least it's going to take that long. You know, some people do take three hours, and some people take two hours. You know, but to do it in less than two hours, you know, if somebody said, "Oh, I finished I'm chanting in one hour," you know, then we're very doubtful. You know. <laughs> that how is it you can chant so quickly? So, if you're chanting very quickly, then you have to chant more. <laughs> but we should, we should make arrangements that we have about two, at least two hours a day to chant the Holy Name, to associate with Krishna through His Holy Name. Now in chanting the Holy Name, there are qualities in chanting. It's not that everybody's chanting is the same. Some people are beginning to chant, somebody else is a regular chanter. The scriptures describe that there is Nam Aparad, Nam Abhas, and Shuddhana. There is the offensive chanting, there's a shadow of pure chanting, and then there is a pure holy name. So, there are ten offenses to be avoided in chanting of the holy name. And generally, in our temples, uh, in the morning, we like to recite these ten offenses, just to remind us of how to properly chant the holy name. So traditionally, at the time of initiation, we will speak something about these ten offenses. The first offense is to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to propagating the Holy Name. It's very important for us not to fall into the habit of being critical of other devotees. That is, becomes a, a, an offense. The devotees are trying to serve Krishna, and if we criticize them or look at their faults, it is not very good for us. It is the nature of Kali Yuga that we, we like to argue, we quarrel with each other. Little things, tiny things become a mountain. 
You know, the molehill becomes a mountain. We want to make the mountain the molehill. Reverse the process. Don't see the faults. We encourage the devotees. Don't see faults in others. See our own faults. That is much better. Try to appreciate other devotees. The more we can appreciate the service of other devotees, that will be very good for our Krishna consciousness. If we always see what this devotee is doing and think, oh, they're doing such a nice service for Krishna, then that is very nice. It's very healthy. Sign. But Prabhupada became worried when devotees would write to him if they would complain about devotees. He would be very pleased when they would write glorifying other devotees. But when they would write criticizing and complaining about devotees, he was not happy. So, we have to be careful not to fall into that trap because the nature of our mind is to look at faults in others and not to see our own faults. The second offense is to consider names of the demigods, like Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma and so many other demigods, to consider their names to be equal to the holy name of Lord Vishnu. Now we should understand that a devotee should not be disrespectful to the devas. We also offer our respects to the devas. In fact, we describe Lord Shiva as being the greatest Vaishnava. And we, we seek the blessings of Lord Shiva to destroy our false ego. Because Lord Shiva is the Lord of Ahankar. And by the mercy of Lord Shiva, he can help us to remove that false ego. So Lord Shiva is a very exalted personality. And he's very, a very dear servant of the Supreme Lord Vishnu and Lord Krishna. But he's not the Supreme. We should respect, but at the same time understand his proper position. And other demigods are on a lesser position than Lord Shiva. We should understand they are also important personalities. They've been given some position, responsibility in the material world, and we should respect them. I was with Srila Prabhupada one time in London and we went to a Hindu temple for a program and they had very big pictures on their, out on their stage, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And I can remember Srila Prabhupada's words. He says that a devotee of Krishna not only offers respects to Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, but a devotee of Krishna will offer their respects even to the tiny insect like an ant. Because the Supreme Lord is in the heart of all living entities. So we offer our respects to all the living entities, knowing that the Supreme Lord is in the heart of everyone. The third offense is to disobey the order of the spiritual master. We should understand the spiritual master as the representative of Lord Krishna. So by their instructions, we can learn how to please Lord Krishna. We need that kind of guidance. Previously, I did teach one course here called the Disciple Course. And that course it's, it's quite likely that next year it's going to become mandatory for all candidates taking initiation, accepting initiation in the Krishna consciousness movement. So in that course, the disciple course, we explained that the spiritual master who gives initiation is one, but there are many other people who give instruction. They are called Shiksha Gurus, and their qualification is the same as the qualification of the one giving the initiation or the Diksha. And 
we're encouraged as devotees that we should also have, as well as accepting initiation, we should also have shiksha gurus, we should have people who regularly give us instruction, who guide us in our Krishna consciousness. We also quoted the words of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, that Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur said he considered the shiksha, the position of one giving shiksha, to be even more important than that person giving in the diksha. Because it is by shiksha that we can get instruction about the regular principles of devotional service in the course of our daily activities. You know, giving initiation is one thing, but as, as a giving initiation, how, how long I will be able to stay here after giving initiation? I cannot stay very long, I have to go other places. And the same is true for many other spiritual masters. But one needs to have regular instruction. And there are a number of senior Vaishnavas here, and you are also encouraged to take instruction from them regularly and to respect them just as you would respect also the initiating spiritual We should respect all the persons who give regular instruction, who guide us and help us in the regular activities of our devotional service. Very important. Of course, we have also our connection with Srila Prabhupada. Now, Srila Prabhupada is the founder Acharya of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And all of the devotees in the Krishna Consciousness Movement are encouraged to develop their relationship with Srila Prabhupada. When we give classes, we use the books of Srila Prabhupada. We don't just use any book, but we we're using Prabhupada's books, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Prabhupada's Chaitanya Charitamrita. These are all Prabhupada's books and there are many more also by Prabhupada. So we are encouraged to see Srila Prabhupada to develop and cultivate our relationship with Srila Prabhupada. And we should know Srila Prabhupada's instruction giving initiation and giving instruction, all of these things, the purpose of both the initiation and the instruction is to bring us closer to Srila Prabhupada and to the great Acharyas in the disciplic succession. Not only Srila Prabhupada, but all of the great Acharyas in the line of disciplic succession. We want to cultivate our relationship with all of these great personalities. We celebrate their appearance days, their disappearance days. It's all very important for us and we, we have to hear about their life and their activities. And in this way we get more inspiration and we get more understanding and how we should act, how we should be as a devotee. So this is part uh, oh, this is part of the process of initiation, and pro for proper chanting, we have to also properly we have to follow the instructions of the spiritual teacher. Not just one teacher, not only the diksha guru, but also the shiksha gurus. Now the people giving instructions and giving initiation, ideally they should give the same instruction. At least the principles should be the same. The details may vary. In devotional service, the principles are the same. They're not going to change. We mentioned four regulated principles. Cleanliness, mercy, austerity, truthfulness. These principles have to be there. The principle of always being engaged in Krishna service. Now how we're going to serve Krishna that is a detail. The details may vary. 
one person will tell us to do one thing. He may say, oh, I want you to go and distribute books. Or he may say, I want you to cook prasadam, to cook nice preparations to offer to Lord Jagannath. Or I want you to, I want you to begin maybe Bhakti Briksha, make a group, get a group of people and do Bhakti Briksha programs. Very nice, actually. So these are details how we're going to serve Krishna. No details will, will vary from one person to another, but the principles are the same. So we should try to follow these instructions of the spiritual teacher. And if we don't, if we purposely disobey the instructions, then it becomes offensive. And it, it affects the quality of our chanting. The fourth principle is to blaspheme Vedic literature, or the literatures and pursuance of the Vedic version. Uh, it is pointed out that if we don't read the books regularly, this is also an offense. We're neglecting them. Many of you may be keeping the books at home, but how many are reading them regularly? You know, sometimes you go to the home and you take a book off the shelf and you see, oh, it's still got the plastic on, never <laughs> open. You know? We wonder how often they use the book. So this is not good. You have the books, it's very nice you have the books in your home, but we should also use them. We should read them regularly. And we should not blaspheme other Vedic literatures. Some literatures may be speaking more about impersonal conceptions of God, or they may be emphasizing the Astanga Yoga or something like this. We should not be critical of these literatures. We should understand they're also the Vedic path. We know they're not teaching the highest, they're not teaching Bhakti Yoga, and they're not attractive to ourselves, but we should understand not everyone is able to take up Bhakti Yoga. So we should not be critical of Vedic literature. We should understand their purpose. The fifth offense is to give some interpretation of the holy name of the Lord. Uh, interpretation of the name of the Lord. We should understand the name of the Lord as it is explained to us by the Acharyas, not by our own mental speculation. Oh, Krishna means black, so black means something mysterious, something which cannot be known, so Krishna means something which cannot be known. This is speculation. So this is not how to understand the holy name. Uh, the sixth offense is to consider the glories of chanting Hare Krishna to be imagination. Now one may hear that by once chanting the holy name, one can destroy unlimited amounts of sin. One may think, oh, this is just an exaggeration. I don't really believe it's like that. Just once chant. Why do we just, just by once chanting, we can destroy so many sins? How is it possible? It, it is possible. We should understand it is possible. And if we think like that, that mentality is offensive itself. That we're minimizing the glories of the Holy Name. It is possible that by one's chanting, but one has to chant the name with quality. We said there are qualities in chanting the Holy Name. If we chant the name with offensive mentality, then it will not have that effect. But if we chant the pure name with love of love for the Lord, then certainly one's chanting of the name can destroy unlimited amounts of sin. Very powerful, the holy name of the Lord. And even once chanting is a great benefit for a person. So do not minimize the chanting of the holy name. The seventh offense is to commit sinful activities on the strength of chanting. 
Now, we, when we hear about the power of chanting the holy name, then we will think, well, I will use the holy name to overcome my sinful activities. We purposely go and do something sinful, and then I'll chant Hare Krishna tomorrow. Right? So, this is a very serious offense. It is not at all pleasing to Lord Krishna. You may hear, oh, there's a party tonight. We'll go to the party. We'll eat bad things. We'll drink bad things. I'll chant Hare Krishna tomorrow. Make up. This is an offense. This is like the bathing of the elephant. Or it's like pouring water onto a fire. You're starting a fire and you're pouring water. You're counteracting your chanting of Hare Krishna. So this mentality in chanting of Hare Krishna, that we're chanting, even though we purposely did sins, we just chant Hare Krishna to overcome the sins. This is not acceptable. Lord Krishna is not pleased with this kind of chanting. The eighth offense is to consider chanting Hare Krishna as one of the auspicious Ritualistic activity offered in the Vedas is karmakanda or fruit of activities. So there are many karmakandi activities. There are many temples here, and you can often go to the temple. You see people doing some karmakandi activities. So we may think chanting Hare Krishna is like that. That you get money, you get you get good luck. You know you you get you can destroy that the difficulties or the obstacles in your life. So a devotee should not think like that. Rather, our purpose in chanting Hare Krishna is to please Krishna, for the pleasure of Krishna. We're doing bhakti yoga, devotional service. Our chanting of the names of God is meant to give pleasure to the Lord. We should not be thinking of what I will get from this chanting. Prabhupada often told us that devotional service means to give up our business. If you do business, the business mentality is, I'll give you the goods, you give me money. Right? But Krishna consciousness, devotional service is to give to Krishna and not want anything in return. We don't ask Krishna to give me anything. Our only prayer to Krishna is, please engage me in your service. What do we get from chanting the holy name? We get more chanting. That is desirable. Please allow me to do more chanting. So that that should be the mentality, the state of mind for the devotee. That we want to chant the name. And we want to chant the name more and more. The ninth offense is to instruct the holy name to people who have no faith in the holy name. They have no faith in Krishna. Well, how will we ever distribute Krishna consciousness if we don't tell people? about the Holy we have to we have to create faith in people now we we can invite people to chant Hare Krishna without telling them about the intimate glories of the Holy Name we can just tell them you're not the body that's not an offense they don't have to have faith they may not believe but we should tell them you're not the body, you're a soul, you're a servant of Krishna. You can give them the basic knowledge. We can teach them, you have to control your senses, you have to conquer your mind. You can do it by mantra meditation. We have the best mantra and we're not selling it. We're giving it freely to everyone. But we don't tell them the intimate glories of the Holy Name, the intimate glories of Krishna. 
We want gradually we have to create faith. We want to create faith by giving them an opportunity to hear the basic teachings and gradually they can become qualified to understand more of the, the glories of the Holy Name. Then the tenth offense is not to have complete faith in chanting Hare Krishna and to maintain material attachment even after receiving many instructions in this matter. We've had many instructions. We should have faith in these things. Faith in the Holy Name means we don't have so much attachment to the material world. We have to be willing to let go of the material in order to hold on to Krishna. If we want to hold on to Maya and at the same time hold on to Krishna, it's like having one foot in one boat and one foot in another boat. Now, the boats may be together at one point, but after some time the boats may separate. You're going to have a hard time to keep your feet in both boats. In the same way, if, you, if we hold on tightly to the material existence, it will be very difficult for us to properly take shelter of Lord Krishna. So we have to gradually relinquish this attachment for the material world. Attachment for the material world is based on, generally we're thinking about becoming rich, getting wealth and using it for our enjoyment and then of course we have attachment for the opposite sex we have a nice companion and we will enjoy life together live happily like this this is these these attachments are there we have to we have to relate both of these things to krishna now, certainly everyone needs wealth, they need some money to live in this world. We know how expensive Singapore is, so you need some money here. But we're not overly anxious to get more and more money. We will accept what comes by the grace of Krishna, by our honest endeavor, without overly exerting ourselves. We have to make time, as I said, two hours for chanting. Now, many people will say, I don't have time. I'm very busy. That, that means you're very busy with material life. We take time to eat. We take time to sleep. But no time to chant. Then you don't think spiritual practice is very important. If we understand the importance of something, we will make time to do it. So, chanting is required. You have to make, take some time. Money is also required. We accept what comes by the grace of Krishna. And also, com our family, companionship. Yes, we have to take care of them. We have responsibilities. A devotee is not neglectful in the course of his duties. He will take care of his family. He will see Krishna within the heart of the wife and the children. And he will keep them in Krishna consciousness. That is part of the duty of a Krishna conscious person. So then he also mentions that it is offensive to be inattentive while chanting. And this inattention by chanting, while chanting, this is considered to be the seed of all offenses in the chanting of the Holy Name. From this one offense, all the other offenses come. So very important to give attention when we chant. We have to be careful of distractions. Now, when you have children, that's a distraction because you have to take care of your children. So we encourage people who have a young family, you have to chant 
when the children are not there or when they're asleep because you have to take time and take care of your children you can't just neglect them they need your time so we, we once they go to sleep then you can chant or wake up earlier before the children wake up all right once they've gone to school then okay then you can chant but you'll find it difficult to chant when the children are around. Distractions are there. Trying to chant in front of a television is not recommended. <laughs> and then everyone's got a handphone, a mobile phone. These things are also distractions. Because in the course of your chanting, somebody's going to call you. And you get distracted. So it's a good idea to switch off your mobile phone for a little while and just chant. You have to say, I'm just going to chant. I'm not going to take any calls. Turn off your mobile phone for a, an hour or something and do some chanting. But to chant one hand in the big bag and the other hand on the mobile phone, where is the mind? The mind is more on the phone than in the big bag. And similarly, driving while chanting, you know, we encourage people, yeah, chant. It's good to chant, but, you know, be careful. And certainly your chanting while driving is not going to be as good as if you just simply sit and chant. So, also, sometimes apathy, that's another problem in chanting. But we think, oh, this is not a problem. Oh, <laughs> we have to keep a an enthusiastic mood, we have to know. This is the most important thing. The real, our real business is the chanting of the Holy Name. The most important instruction of all the spiritual teachers is to chant the Holy Name. So it's our first business. So if we keep that mood, then we'll, we'll understand the importance of this chanting. Okay, so now we're going to give the, we have beats. Uh, I, chant, I chanted one round on these beats, and we're going to give the beats to the candidates taking the initiation, the first initiation. There are actually uh, five elements to initiation. There is, first of all, the tapa, following the rules and regulations. So the candidates will take the vows. And then second part is uh, putting on tea light, 